pull up the notes on my phone here. Yeah, so thanks for coming, everyone. I really appreciate it. I think a lot of you already know me, but in case you don't know me, I'm from Australia. I moved to Vancouver five years ago, and I actually just live up the road, which is crazy. And I've never been down here before. So yeah, cheers, man. Um, so I've been a full-time DJ for about 11 years, and I released my first record nine years ago. And since then, I think I've released like 80, 70 or 80 songs. I tried to count them, but there's all these remixes and stuff. Um, and yeah, I've been doing Ableton tutorials on YouTube for about six years. Oh yeah, let me show you some slides. So here's a couple of photos of me being an absolute badass. <laughs> that was in Australia. I just got back from Australia on a tour. That was also in Australia, but um, last, the year before last. And uh, there's not too many photos at Fractal Forest, but I found this sneaky one. <laughs> so yeah, anyway, if you're not already subscribed to my YouTube channel, make sure you go and do that, because I do advanced Ableton tutorials, and a lot of the tutorials that I've made have been featured on the Ableton website, which is kind of cool. So this is kind of weird for me, because um, <clears throat> I didn't, I didn't go to school, I didn't do what you guys are doing, or well, some of you aren't going to this school, but I kind of taught myself everything that I know. Um, I think I did like one year of piano when I was a kid, but I taught myself, you know, music production, DJing, scratching, taught myself how to edit videos, um, taught myself like HTML, CSS, how to use WordPress, set up like an e-commerce website, um, wrote all this code and um, I figured out how to manufacture and design like merchandise and accessories and then sell that online and I'm kind of a DUI guy so I actually taught myself a bit of woodworking as well and made the desk in my studio that's my studio and there's me looking like a doofus um, but um, I taught myself a lot of things but I'm not gonna pretend like I didn't have any help along the way, but you know, the important thing is that I was hungry to learn, you know? I, <clears throat> I asked questions and then I did experiments to confirm the answers that people gave me or, you know, falsify those answers. And, you know, I like retained the knowledge. I was like really hungry to learn. I was like a sponge. I just wanted to know everything there was to know about music. Um, but, you know, I don't, I don't know everything there is to know about music still, so I still consider myself a student like you guys. Um, but yeah, I guess I just want to say, like, just talk to people, talk to each other, and then actually listen to what they say. And instead of talking at people, you know, ask them questions and see what they have to say. And you'll always learn something. Like, it doesn't matter if, like, it's some guy with 12 followers on SoundCloud or, like, the DJ at the local bar or, you know, some famous dude or whatever. Like, um, Sticky Buds or someone or Funk Hunters or whatever. Um, you know, their life experiences are going to be a lot different to yours, so you'll learn something from them. I actually learned a lot collaborating on tracks with Sticky Buds, who has like twice the following as me. And then I also learned a lot from collaborating with guys like Granular Sumo, which some of you guys are nodding your heads, but most of you guys probably don't know Granular Sumo. He's like some kid from the UK, half my age, with like 300 followers on SoundCloud. And yeah, I, we still collabed and I really learned a lot from him. So yeah. Talk to people, actually listen to what they say, because you'll probably you know, learn something. So I wasn't always an international DJ, super cool guy or whatever. Um, <laughs> after I finished high school, I was just working at like the fast food call center, you know, gas station jobs with like zero goals and aspirations and Producing music was just a hobby. I actually didn't even know that it was called producing and I didn't know that I was being a producer until much later. 
I was like 15 when I kind of got into it. But yeah, after high school, working shitty jobs, DJing was a hobby, music production was a hobby, and you know, I was just interested in learning about music and how it's created and how it's performed. I wanted to know everything there was about it. You know, I tried to hang out with like-minded people. I went to like cringy hip hop events for kids. And like these kids were like trying to b-boy and I would just be like standing over the decks asking newbie questions like, what's that crossfader do? Or what's a slip mat and stuff. Just trying to pick up tips wherever I could. And uh, I went to like, I went to a couple of things kind of like this when I was starting out but they were mostly like at equipment stores and they were mostly trying to sell you equipment. <laughs> but it was cool, I got a couple of tips here and there. And every night after work I'd fire up my terrible um, DJ equipment or Ableton and write a terrible song or record a shitty mix and you know, every time I got a little bit better but I was still kind of bad. <laughs> so, and then when I was 19, um, a friend of mine knew a guy who DJed at this little underground cafe and the dude double booked himself and was trying to offload his cafe gig to someone and that someone turned out to be me because my friend recommended me but it was like my first time DJing anywhere for reals in front of real people in public where people will see me <laughs> so uh, I was a little bit nervous but you know, I was excited. I got real into it, you know? I was like, oh man, I'll burn, I'll burn some mixed CDs. I'll make some business cards. This is my first business card. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh yeah. That's fresh. Yeah. I was, yeah, promotional art. Aren't I great at that? I would say, I'm still good at that. No. Um, anyway, I rolled in with my <laughs> business card and mix CD gave it to the owner and um, before I even started DJing he was like wow you're all prepared he was like he was like impressed by my eager attitude and he just like fired the other guy and then hired me and then I yeah I was like well that was a pretty rash decision but all right <laughs> so I ended up DJing there for six hours every Friday and Saturday night for two years. Um, and the pay was 20 bucks an hour, two beers and a pizza. And uh, the guys in the kitchen would always put like heaps of chili on like one slice. So I'd be like eating the pizza. It was like pizza roulette. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> these bastards. Anyway, um, I was really bad at DJing. I was a bad DJ. I, I made all the mistakes. I trained rec mixes. My laptop was like, old and it just would turn itself off and stuff sometimes but um, uh, eventually I realized that you know people wouldn't people wouldn't dance unless they kind of had something to to latch onto. this is the place by the way so the DJ box is down here in the back um, it's a restaurant you know and then people would stay late and then have a couple drinks and I had to try and keep them dancing <laughs> But they needed something to latch onto, something familiar. So I noticed they like funk and hip hop, but when I played like the B-side, um, kind of rarer funk that I thought was really funky, you know, it kind of just cleared dance floors. So I thought I'd use Ableton to put like a familiar hip hop acapella on top of the funk song, make it like a little matchup. And, and then I played it out and it worked really well. People were like, whoa, damn, this is some crazy remix or whatever. And then I started like going further with it. I thought maybe I'll make the drums fatter as well. And then it'll really like punch. And then maybe I'll add a bass line as well. And why stop at sampling like two songs? Why not three or four, make a collage kind of thing? And you know, all this was happening over the two years and eventually I ended up with like probably 20 or 30 little DJ edits and remixes and mashups and stuff. Um, Oh yeah, by the way, check this out. <laughs> That's me DJing. So these two speakers I had to pull out of the storeroom in the back and then I have to get mil the milk crates from up the stairs and then set everything up. And look what I've got on the table. I've got a belt drive turntable, a Behringer four channel mixer, 
<laughs> and a laptop and a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> and there's my only fan in the back there. Oh, and look, I got a, I have like one record and um, <laughs> I think it was just like some scratch tools. This is kind of a segue, but see, oh yeah, so I was using Tractor, like old school Tractor, right? And see this massive electrical tape? <laughs> so that, that cable is, it began its life as one of these cables, right? And in Tractor, I realized in the settings, you could set up the left deck to, to only come out of the left channel and the right deck to only come out of the right channel. Because I didn't have a sound card. I couldn't afford a sound card. So this is my solution, right? I just plug it right into the mixer like that. Input one, deck, deck one, deck two, and then I put the speakers in, but music was only coming out of one speaker. I didn't know what was going on. So my solution to that was to get out the scissors and the electrical tape and do this. <laughs> and I didn't have a soldering iron. I'm just stripping the wires with my teeth and stuff. Uh, I plugged them in like that, and then I could DJ in mono sounds. And it was sweet. Um, so yeah. But anyway, I, I'll just leave that up so you can <laughs> get your head around how ridiculous that is. Um, yeah, no sound cards. Uh, yeah, no sound card. Eventually I did get one. So I started playing more of those remixes that I was making and the cafe was um, open later and later because people would stay for longer for my music. I started to get paid more and um, I used the money to upgrade my gear get new headphones, a sound card. And yeah, and then like I started DJing weddings. The owner was like, pe people were going and asking the owner like, can we book this guy to DJ our wedding? So I DJed a bunch of weddings. Glad I don't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, every Friday night I'd go, after DJing at the Verve Cafe, which is like this place. Yeah, that place. Um, I'd go out to, Rick's bar, and upstairs they had like a hip hop DJ playing. I loved the DJs there. I'd go there every Friday night just by myself. I didn't, my friends are like going to like the cool, uh, I don't know, techno place or whatever. But I'm just like at this tiny bar at Rick's listening. And I'd always hang around until the end of the night and like talk to the DJs and be like, what was that song? Can you show me that record? And these, these DJs were playing like you know, two turntables with real vinyl, and they were like real DJs. And so I really respected them, and, and the music they were playing was amazing. Um, that's the club there, it's a bad photo I took <laughs> on my like flip phone or whatever I had back then. Um, anyway, one night I went in and there was a different DJ I hadn't seen before. It was this guy, his name's Butters. And um, I was talking to him I was like, yeah, man, I love that song. And he's like, oh, dude, you know, you know your shit. Are you a DJ as well? And I'm like, kind of, not really. Anyway, he invited me to a party that he was promoting at the Moon Bar. And the Moon Bar is like, that was like the coolest club to play at. It's where they fly in all the international DJs to DJ at. And um, I was like, wow, OK, cool. So. He gave me a flyer and I went to the party and thinking back to how I got my gig at the Verve Cafe, you know, the equation is give them a business card and a mix CD and then you'll get a residency. <laughs> so that's what I did again with this guy. I gave him a business card and a mix CD and then I just enjoyed my night at the party. And then two days later he calls me up saying that he put the mix CD on at a at his after party and he really liked it so he booked me he booked me for a show this is my first real show at the moon bar and um, I had like the opening slot and I made sure every single person that I knew was there ex-girlfriends people I hadn't spoken to in years my mom my cat just everyone I tried to like because 
people knew that I was interested in DJing, but now I had like a real gig. So people started to take notice, like, oh, he's actually got a gig now. Like maybe we'll actually go and check that out. Because nobody wanted to come to the Verve Cafe. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of lame there. Um, so anyway, yeah, here, here I am playing. So what's funny actually is this mixer, we were just setting up getting ready to go and um, I plugged my headphones into the headphone jack on that mixer and the headphone jack like fell into the mixer. <laughs> and I look at the clock and it's like five minutes till opening, five minutes till my set is supposed to start. And we have to pull all the knobs off of the faceplate and unscrew the faceplate, um, pull it off. So like I was already nervous, you know, and like it made it um, even more nervous for me, but it was cool. By the way, you can see I'm DJing uh, this Crafty Cuts record. Bring back the funk. Yeah, so I was playing, by this point, I had like a crate of records in my bag. I was playing real vinyl, and I had my laptop there and my mouse, just in case, <laughs> with Tractor, so I could click, you know. Um, I didn't have a ton of records, so I was worried I would run out. But anyway, it was good. Like, people were dancing, and all my friends were there, and it was awesome. And then Butters came over to me. That's Butters there. That was one of the other DJs that used to play at Rick's. Um, Butters came over to me like halfway through my set and he said, dude, you're smashing it. You're gonna be DJing all over town after this. And he's like, I'll hook you up with like this guy and I know that guy that works at this club. And like he was right, like he hooked me up and I just, I think I played like every single club in Brisbane um, where I grew up. I don't think I mentioned that. I grew up in Brisbane. Um, and then I started flying out to like Sydney and Melbourne and DJing down there and then over to Perth and pretty quick I was playing like four or five gigs a weekend. I'd play one show over here, catch a cab, same night, play another show over there. And um, you know, I quit my fast food call center gas station job and yeah. And I was producing this whole time as well. So, um, you know, I found a record label called Good Groove that was releasing similar stuff to me. So I reached out to them and then I released my first record with them in 2009. And then Good Groove Records kind of had ties with um, Shambhala. They knew someone that worked at Shambhala. And then I played at Shambhala. They booked me to play at Shambhala, 2009. So like my first show was like, what, 2008? And then 2009, I released this record. That's April 2009. And then August 2009. That's pretty crazy. Um, it was my first time overseas and my first time DJing at a festival. So <laughs> I was kind of, I was confident, no. <laughs> I, was, I was shitting bricks. Um, yeah, just looking at that picture makes me nervous. But so, through some kind of miracle, I like smashed the set. And then that set and this, this pl playing at the Fractal Forest just fully changed my life. Since then, um, I played that show. Then two years after, they booked me again. And then I think it was around the same time I, I did a tour of Canada, I think it was like a two month tour and I just played like every city in Canada. Um, and then I think uh, this year I DJed Shambhala for the eighth time. So hold your applause till the end. <laughs> I've always wanted to say that, hold your applause till the end. It's like, it's like the most efficient way to let everyone know you're a douche. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, so that's what I've been doing since then, is just um, DJing all over the place. These are a bunch of tour, f tour posters. And um, yeah, too easy, right? End of presentation. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Just do that, and then you'll be DJing at Shambhala. It's too easy. Um, no. Uh, the reason I told you that whole story is to actually outline how not easy it is, how very, very not easy it is. Um, and some of you might be thinking, hey, he got lucky. 
Good Groove, you know, how did he get that booking at Shambhala? Even that cafe, he got lucky with the guy firing the other guy. And you're kind of right, those things were lucky, but they were just, they were just opportunities, you know, and if I wasn't prepared to take full advantage of those opportunities, they could have easily been dead ends. And there was a lot of parts to that story that I didn't tell you where, you know, which were all the times that I totally fucked up, all the times I had dead ends and just played at gigs and then lost the show, got fired or just bombed. And, you know, there was many, many times when I um, totally messed up. You know, it's easy to just tell you all the good things that happened, right? Um, and it's not like these opportunities kind of just fell into my lap either, you know? Like, I had to kind of, it was hard to get here, right? Like, DJing two years, six hour sets, Friday and Saturday night. I had to catch a train with my belt drive, turntable, mixer, laptop, and mouse. Mm -hmm. And then walk from the train station and set everything up. I had to arrive like an hour and a half early every time. And, um, you know, sitting in my room for hours and hours, just teaching myself how to use Ableton, putting acapellas on funk songs and working shitty jobs to afford the gear. It was hard. It was hard. And also, think about this, right? The DJ Butters that invited me to his party, he didn't say, you know what you should do? You should make me a mix CD and a business card and then give it to me at the party and then, you know, I'll book you for a set and then after that, you'll be DJing all over town. He just said, come to the party. And I made the opportunity something, something bigger, you know? I, I made something greater out of that opportunity. And with Good Groove, the, rec the first record I released, um, they didn't send me an email saying like, hey, we've heard of you for some reason and we'd like to um, release an EP of your music. You know, no. I recognized that my music that I was writing was kind of similar to theirs. And I also recognized that it was a fairly new label, uh, kind of a boutique sort of label. And I reached out to them and over like a month, I spammed them and all the artists that were on that label on MySpace <laughs> uh, for like a month until finally Featurecast um, took notice and then he put in a good word for me and told the guy Slim to contact me about an EP and then, then I had to write three songs and then make sure that they liked them as well. And yeah, like it was hard is what I'm trying to say. But my first time at Shambhala, <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, <fa> my first time at Shambhala, uh, again, I was, I was um, on networking hyperdrive, you know. I didn't really have many fans. Some people heard my record, but I only had one record out, I think, at that point. And so I was the fan, and I was going around trying to meet everyone. I tried to meet every DJ and producer I could, and I made sure everyone remembered my name. I gave them mix CDs. I didn't have the business cards anymore. <laughs> I got buttons instead with my, my logo on it. And um, you know, I tried to leave a mark. Um, I tried to leave a small mark. A small mark <coughs> was made at Shambhala. A stain, if you will. <laughs> kind of like a stain. <laughs> but anyway, I met Sticky Buds and I met his manager. And his manager is now my manager because I asked him to be my manager. <laughs> and he didn't offer or say anything about looking for new artists. It just happened to be like the right time, the right place, met the right dude. And also, I had the balls to ask the guy, want to be my manager? And he said yes. So, you know, I st the whole point is like, um, I saw like a, I saw a closed door and then I just knocked. And I said, hey, what's up? Want to do some shit together? Yeah. So pretty much, quick re recap. Make sure you talk to people, because you might learn something. And then actually listen to what they say. Ask them questions instead of telling them what you're doing, you know what I mean? And try and learn from people. And then be prepared to take full advantage of opportunities, because they don't always fall into your lap. So when they do, you've got to be like ready, because they might come out of nowhere. And also, if the opportunity 
sometimes the opportunity is like, kind of makes you feel uncomfortable, like what I'm doing right now. I've never done this before, but I said yes to it. Um, so, you know, when I, when I first got my, my first DJ gig, I was nervous, I'd never DJed, but I just said yes. You know, you just gotta jump in the deep end because it's the only way you're gonna learn. You know what I mean? Um, and then, yeah, opportunities don't fall into your lap, so sometimes you've gotta go out there and create the opportunities for yourself. Um, there was a lot of times when I went out just handing business cards and mix CDs to just random people that worked at clubs. Some of them I got gigs at, some of them I didn't. Some of them I played one show and then never played again. Um, but just going out there and making opportunities for yourself by doing something about it. And then yeah, when you see a closed door knock, I still do that. Like the other week, um, I emailed Isotope. You guys know Isotope plugins, the baddest, most expensive plugins uh, of all time. Well, I just emailed them and I'm like, hey, Isotope, my name's Slink, I'm a badass. Can I have all your plugins for free? And they said yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> just, just go and ask people right. for stuff. We do. Big <laughs> and I oh. for free <laughs> Well, they're not going to give you guys. <laughs> you got to, you got to be a badass first. No, um, but you know what I mean. Like, that's the point, anyways. Is go and ask people, talk to people. You guys get it. And I know it's kind of cliche as well. Like, it's no way you know. It's who you know. But it's actually true. So anyway. The importance of work ethic. Um, so I was like, I was kind of okay with just like cruising along at my own pace, like missing deadlines and just like, you know, just floating along, DJing wherever the opportunities that fell into my lap took me. And then I kind of found myself in a position where the people around me, like the record labels, my manager, the promoters, um, even the bartenders that bartend at the clubs and stuff, I realized that they, they kind of all rely on me to do a good job. And I'm kind of like a source of income for like all these people down the line and stuff. Um, so I sort of realized that like, hang on a minute. Well, I was living the dream, but <laughs> yeah, I'll get back to that slide. I was like, hang on a minute. You know, DJing and production is my actual job. Like, it's in my actual job. It's like my career. Um, and when I, when I had that, like, kind of realization, I lost the romantic kind of idea of, like, oh, I don't have a bus, and I, I wake up whenever and work, if you can even call it that, because I'm, all I'm doing is writing tunes, and it's awesome. Um, and then like, you know, creativity just like comes to me whenever and, and if I'm not feeling it that day, then like I don't, I don't want to force anything, you know. That was kind of like how I used to think. And then, and then it kind of all fell into like this kind of situation where, you know, <laughs> oh man, like I'm being paid to do this remix, the deadline's tomorrow, I, you know, like uh, what happened to those samples? and. What, what did I name that file? Just, it was ridiculous. I actually saved every single, this is so dumb, but I saved every single project that I made between like 2007 and like 2011 or something in one folder called It's the Motherfucking Remix. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and like, this is, these are actual screenshots from my computer. Like, that's an actual project I have. Some drum and bass chord thing. Chopping shit up and stuff, version five. <laughs> you know, there's no way to live. And also, my DJ, my DJ setup was like, my, my library was just horrible. You know, where did I put that song? Is it in the in string strikes of the bang bum boogie folder or underwater lobster grooves. I don't even know what that means. And nothing was tagged, like nothing was tagged. I don't know who that song's by, but I have it in my library. So, you know, I had to get organized, right? This is ridiculous. This is my job, this is my career. 
it's time to start like treating it like a job. Um, but you know, I'm kind of a lazy artist. But I thought I would kind of split my personality up into two, you know. That's not a photo of me, by the way. That's just some guy on the internet. <laughs> and I photoshopped Rocket League on top of his screen. <laughs> um, I split my personality up into two people, the lazy artist and then the boss. And the boss makes the rules, and the lazy artist follows the rules, right? It's pretty simple. I was thinking back to like, working at a gas station or whatever, and you'd have the boss like breathing down your neck about like policies and procedures. And, you know, because I'm my own boss, I had to be my own boss. Like I had to act actively be my own boss and then breathe down my own neck <laughs> about policies. <laughs> so anyway, the first rule I made was some work hours. Monday to Friday, at least six hours a day, sometime between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. You know, I'm a cool boss. I like to be a little bit flexible. I'm dealing with a lazy artist here, so I've got to make it something like somewhat achievable. And Monday to Friday, like sometimes I'm flying back, I'm all jet lagged or whatever you need to sleep in. Um, and then to enforce the work rules, I installed an app on my computer called Time Camp, and I seriously recommend everyone here get this app if you want to increase your productivity because every week it sends you an email to tell you how much of a lazy piece of garbage you are. <laughs> um, and you can see this particular week I spent four hours playing Natural Selection 2, uh, three hours playing StarCraft 2, and then goofing around on YouTube and Facebook. And then if you want even more details about why you're a lazy piece of garbage, you can click and it gives you like a breakdown of all the reasons why. <laughs> uh, so you can see, yeah. And I'm not even that good, I'm only like gold league. <laughs> so here's a, here's a little bit of a better week, okay? I only watched a little bit of StarCraft instead of playing it. Um, I spent a lot of time in Ableton, that's good. Well, six hours on YouTube, that's not so good. But if you do the math, 15 hours over five days, that's only three hours a day. That's like nothing. It's like half of what I want to be doing. So it's really good because you can look at your past weeks and be like, what was I doing, you know? What's the, why, why am I playing video games? What's the point of that? Um, so yeah. Anyway, I had to come up with like, the, the boss had to tell the lazy artist to, to get his shit together and get organized, right? So I started um, naming my project files, putting them in separate folders, and then in subfolders as well, according to what it is, you know, this is my album, I've got some other folders as well that I'm not showing you because it's stuff I'm still working on. Mm -hmm. I organized my sample library as well. You know, you download all these sample libraries and it's just like, Bangin' Beats, volume three. And then inside there, there's like all these folders. And so when you look at the, your main folder of sample libraries, it's just like, what's in Bangin' Beats? So I took everything out of these individual folders and just put them into categorized things, like folders, right? All my guitars are in there, all my horns are in there, all my bass one shots are in there. It's easy to find stuff. And same with my music library. I set up um, smart playlists in iTunes and I made sure that I um, tag the metadata on all my mp3s and stuff with the correct genre tags, the correct artist names. I really just like spent a bunch of time working on this and my emails, right? I, I, uh, this is actually something I kind of did not too long ago, but I sorted out my emails. So I've set up a bunch of filters. So whenever someone, whenever I get an email from like Craigslist or someone sends me a message on SoundCloud, it just goes into that folder and then I don't have to see it in my main inbox. Same with all this stuff. Like someone buys something on my website, I get an email. So if I buy something on Amazon, I get an email. You know, if someone sends me a promo, I get an email. I haven't checked my promos in a while. And all these emails just build up and then every day you've got to like spend an hour or two just deleting stuff or 
you find yourself going down this other path of like replying to someone on Facebook or YouTube or whatever. So I just get that stuff out of my face and then I'm left with just like the important things in my inbox. So I recommend doing that. And then I sorted out my finances. I had to make like my own tax invoices and stuff. I don't do that anymore. My manager does it for me, but um, I, I got a second business account that I only buy stuff related to my business out of, which makes it easy to do my taxes at the end of the year. All these little things, just like the little like, just little things you gotta do. You know what I mean? I was being my own boss actively being my own boss and telling the lazy artist to get off his butt and do something about it. So after all that, like organizing all my stuff, you know, I kind of opened up SoundCloud, looked at my follower account, and it hadn't gone up. Even though like, I felt like it did a bunch of work, you know, obviously it hasn't gone up because I haven't released any songs. So I was kind of like, was that a waste of time? Um, so, that kind of brings me to the next point, which is how to correctly measure your success. And I don't mean success like, you know, all time success. I'm kind of just talking about like, how you feel at the end of the day, you know? Because um, there's a big difference between like having a goal and then measuring your like day-to-day -day success. Uh, when you got a big goal like touring Europe or release an album or DJ at Shambhala or something like that, at the, end of, at the end of the day, it can kind of seem pretty impossible to achieve, especially if you spend the entire day creating filters in Gmail so that when you buy something on Amazon, the receipt goes into a folder. You know, it's like, it's, it feels like a waste of time. But, you know, maybe, maybe uh, you spent all day reading the manual for Serum, but you didn't make any sounds. You know, it kind of, it doesn't feel like your dreams are coming any closer to coming true. Um, it's much easier to feel good about yourself when you've got like a little to-do list and then you do the things on the list and then you feel good. Like when you have those days when you just like go grocery shopping, take out the trash, do the laundry, you do those things and then at the end of the day, you cross them off your to-do list and then you feel good because you feel like you did a good job. You did all the things that day that you wanted to do. But producing an album, you know, you can't do that in one day and then tick it off the list like, done the album, you know. It takes like years sometimes or several months or years to write an album, right? And that's just for like people that know what they're doing. Like people that if you guys are like learning and stuff, it's like writing an album is a goal that just seems so far away. So you gotta focus on your day-to-day -day progress, you know. You need to congratulate yourself on like the small things that you achieve. I try to focus on the time that I spend in the studio working on something, anything really, something music related, something related to my career because there's a lot of days when I sit down in my studio and I'll spend all day writing the worst song of all time and then at the end of the day, I'll just scrap it and it feels like a failure. You know, I failed that day. But if I think about the time I put in, like, hey man, I put in like a solid six hours today <laughs> or whatever. Sometimes I work longer and yeah, just the important thing is that you put in the hours because sure, I wrote a shitty song that day. Now I know what not to do next time I write a song, right? Or, you know, I'm getting the bad ideas out and then eventually there'll be a good idea, right? Um, you know, putting in the hours, you've got to actively do something that's vaguely related to your goal. And if you're just sitting around waiting for like inspiration to come out of nowhere, you're gonna get nowhere. And like, the other thing is like, I don't really, like 99% of the time I'm in my studio, I'm not even trying to write a song. I kind of like avoid writing a song for as long as I can. Sometimes I just gotta write a song. But I try to avoid it, I put it off, and I focus on everything else. Focus on doing everything else that I can. Because if you think about it, right, you know, um, 
just imagine like some dubstep song or whatever. Some of the bass sounds in these dubstep songs are like super complex. Um, and so do you think these dubstep producers or whatever producers were in the middle of writing a song when they decided to do this crazy sound design to make the sound? I seriously, seriously doubt it. You know, they, they were just like sitting there with a blank project, tweaking knobs, making a sound that day, saving the sound at the end of the day. Cool, maybe I'll use that one day. You know what I mean? Because like, you're not, you're not gonna get anywhere if you sit down to write a song and then you're like, yeah, cool. I think like a sweet bass growl would work really well here, right? And then you spend six hours trying to figure out how to make a bass growl. Or maybe you're like, oh, I really could use like a saxophone solo or something here. So you go online and start looking, shopping for like sax sample packs instead of finishing the song. You know, you've got to keep the ideas um, fresh in your mind. Um, I'm kind of, I think I just kind of skipped ahead a bit there. Yeah, speeding up your workflow. Yeah, so this kind of like ties, everything I've been talking about this entire time is basically converging on how to speed up your workflow. Because there's no easy technique or trick to speed up your workflow, unfortunately. Um, but I, I think speeding up your workflow is important because the faster you can get ideas out of your brain and into the computer, um, the better, right? Because ideas, ideas are sort of fleeting. They come and they go, and, and sometimes you've got to force them out. But um, you know, you've got to keep up. I, th I find the most important thing when I'm writing a song is to keep up the momentum and minimize distractions. What, so while your ideas are fresh in your brain, you can just get them out, you know. And that's why you should have some bass growls ready to go instead of spending six hours trying to make one because at the end of those six hours, you're going to be, all the ideas you had for that song in the first place are gone, right? Um, yeah, I kind of already said that. Yeah, and minimize distractions, you know, just check your email once in the morning, check it at the end of the day. Same, same with Facebook. You want to stay focused on the music and, you know, engulf your brain on the music. That's the only way you can kind of like get into that creative sort of in the zone or whatever. As soon as someone's like calling my phone or sending me emails and I start like trying to do, I try, try to multitask it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And it probably won't work for you guys. I don't know what you guys like, but it doesn't work for me. Um, yeah, so all those things should really be taken care of. Just, you gotta have like a good user library, you know? So that when inspiration hits, you can be like, I need a bass growl, boom, I got a bass growl, put it in. Uh, you know, I should have like a bunch of snares ready to go, or even just like a bunch of like percussion and stuff ready to go. And also, you can, f you can pretty easily like forget all the stuff that you've learned. Like, if you guys go on a school here, unless you keep up with practice, you're gonna forget everything that you know within like a month or two, I reckon, <laughs> unless you keep up practice. And you need to really know the ins and outs of all the plugins and samples in your library. You have to know all the plugins you got, what they do, and you know, what they can't do, and all the diff crazy um, creative ways you can use them, if you know what I mean. And this is kind of how you go from being like, oh, having a thought like, yeah, this sound needs to be more metallic, or that snare needs to have more punch, right? To being able to immediately go into your plugins, drag in the right one, tweak it perfectly, and then get the exact result that you want, right? Because you've already, you have a mental map. You have like a mental map of everything you can and can't do with the plugins and tools that are available to you. And you get that map by practicing and just goofing around in Ableton. Just drag in a utility and see how weird you can make things sound. Turn all the knobs and see what they do. Drag in an echo and turn all the knobs and see what they do. You know what I mean? 
Well, that's what I did to teach myself anyways. And it kind of like helps you with like the creative process as well because if you're, um, if, you, if last week you spent a bunch of time turning knobs in Echo and just like, what happens if I had two Echoes or what if I put two Echoes in a rack and then map a bunch of stuff to the macros? And, you know, if you just b spend a bunch of time doing that stuff, then later on when you write in a song, you might be like, maybe I'll try that cool echo t trick that I made up. And then you drag it in, or you, you put it on and try it, doesn't work, it's all good. But it's like something you can kind of draw from. It's almost like a vocabulary, you know what I mean? Like when you're learning to write music, music is a language, right? And learning a language, you usually start off learning the language by learning the swear words, and saying hello and goodbye. And then over time with practice, you build up a vocabulary and then you can really describe things. You know what I mean? Um, so yeah, the point is keep up your practice. Practice every day. You've got to be consistent and writing music in Ableton is also kind of like learning an instrument. You have to practice every day to keep your techniques and your execution sharp, right? Yeah. And that's the end of the little slideshow. So I'm gonna show you um, a couple of things in my vocabulary. Well, I can show you this like, I don't know if, I don't know if you guys are interested, but um, maybe I can show you inside this track that I've been working on. It's a little bit broken right now because I wrote it on my PC and I'm missing some plugins on my Mac here, but you can have a listen. That's not on. This is an unreleased song, it's coming out soon. But um, I don't know, uh, one thing that's really sweet about the way I write songs is this thing right here. Um, do you want me to zoom the thing in or can you guys see that? You guys can see it, right? This thing right here, right? So my main drums, I call the drum meat because it's the meat of the drums, it's the... That's all it is. Just a kick, snare, maybe a crash, some hats maybe. Um, and every time I do this, I have a drum rack with a kick here and a snare there. So I made this sidechain channel with a kick trigger here and a snare trigger here. And all that is, well, this is an old version of me doing it, but it's just a short, as, as short of a sound as you can get it. A really, really, really short sound. That's all it is. Um, I'm even turning it up a bit, so it's like hitting at like exactly zero dB. I'll show you how to make this later, but, um, and then two racks, which are assigned side chain to these signals, and then I'm probably not explaining this very well. You know what, it's probably better if I just like start from the beginning and start again. I'm gonna like write a little song. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, don't say it. I'll show you how much time it takes to make this thing. So, uh, yeah, let's get started here. We'll the drum rack in, and we need a kick. So we'll grab a kick. Um, I know from playing around this plugin a bunch that if I go like this, turn that down a bit, I should have a pretty sweet kick sample. My booth isn't working, so I don't know, does that sound good? Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, and then as far as snares go, I'll just grab like a generic snare from Yeah, I like that one. Keep things organized, right? Type in the name so you know what's what. We'll grab a hat. I wonder how much of a song I can write in front of you guys here. Yeah, that's a good hat. I mean, a hat's a hat, right? It's just a hat. We'll grab a crash as well, I suppose. Sure. Actually, I'll put that there, because I want to copy this one to here. Ah, oh, man. I'm used to my, my uh, what happened here? <laughs> Ungroup that. I'm used to my um, PC shortcut keys. My bad, bear with me. Yeah, so this kick. Let me just get this on. Yeah. So let's go into amp. I'm going to create like a big kind of attack on it. And then. making like a pre-kick because you don't want like it to be like you know like it's better to be like kind of like a, a pre-kick right a pre-kick call that a pre-kick and I'll put a EQ on here take some of the bass out of it maybe Yeah, that sounds pretty good. I think maybe my booth isn't working. If someone wants to help me with that. I turned up this, but it doesn't work. <coughs> we'll do a live. All right, let's name this as well. Call it the drum meat, because it's really the meat of the drums, right? The driving force of the drums. Make like a little pattern here. Um, let's see what what kind of pattern do we want to go with here. Yeah, that'll probably work. No, oh, I don't want to do that. Um, Let's just go like this. Got a groove on there. Slink's funky groove. Nice. Nice. When you apply that to something on there, what does that actually do? What does it actually do? Yeah. If you click commit, you'll see what it does. See how it moves stuff? Stuff is off the grid. Yeah. The only thing that moved really is this one and this one, I think. Yeah. Um, but if you take a groove and then just drag it into um, Ableton, you can see the MIDI file itself. And you can see these are 16ths, right? <coughs> so you can see what happens. The second 16th is moved to the right, and the, f and the third one's moved to the right. Um, and yeah, you guys have seen my videos on that shit. Probably, maybe not. Something like that. Yeah, let's go a little space. Sure, that works. All right, so. What I'm going to do now is. Um, I 
<laughs> put a bunch of stuff in without explaining anything, Oop, and then click the wrong thing. I'm going to set this to resampling. So this analog here, I'm going to uh, actually, I'm going to use an operator. Use an operator, set this to noise. Sweet, right? And I want, I'm just looking at like the, I'm just looking at the volume here. I want it to be like zero dB or close to, there we go. I'm gonna record a little bit of noise and then delete this channel. <laughs> this will make sense in a minute, maybe. And we're going to take a tiny slice of this noise. Cool. That's exactly what we want. Put that in a drum rack. Oh, shoot. C1. I want C1. There it is. So I'm going to call this kick trigger. And I'm putting the kick trigger there because on this channel, I have the kick on C1 as well, right? We're gonna uh, make this uh, as short as possible. Is that as short as we can get it? Pretty much. Nice. <laughs> and I just want to turn the volume up so that it's like... <coughs> 1.4? There we go, that's close enough. It's not hitting at exactly zero dB. Let's pretend. Copy that over to here. Same exact thing, snare. No trigger. Stay organized. And then we can kind of collapse that. Kind of drag in that compressor. This is a Live 10 compressor. And we didn't name this at all, so we're going to call this sidechain. This is going to be like once I show you guys this, this, this is the most efficient and fastest way to sidechain an entire project, in my opinion, to the kicks and snares. Um, yeah, I'm gonna put this in a group. You do all this prep and then you can just save this whole thing. It's awesome. We're gonna select the audio source of the sidechain compression to be the kick trigger, pre-effects. And then I'm gonna duplicate this and do the same thing for the snare trigger pre-effects, right? And then we'll map some things that we'll use quite often, like the threshold, the attack, and the release. I've got the ratio set to infinity, the look ahead at 10, and all this stuff is by default because I right-clicked on this thing and hit save by default. That's how I always have my compressors ready to go. Same deal on this one. Map these guys. And then I'll just give this a kick thresh. Snare thresh. And that's how it's done. So now, if I just set like some kind of generic values here, this is my side chain rack. And for it, as an example to show off how this works, I'm going to put this up the top. We don't need that channel anymore. I'll just grab some chords. I've got some chords here somewhere. Super saw. So maybe I'll just like get my phone out of the way here. I just want to show you guys what, 
how it works, right? Sure. That was sick, eh? Um, well, I don't really need to quantize this, but I will anyway. What note is that? <laughs> All right, cool, cool, cool. So let's pretend these chords are good. And I always have my, I have like a color scheme going. Anyway, let's pretend these chords are good and I want to side chain them to the kicks and snares. We made this side chain rack, so just copy, drag it straight onto there, and then we're done. No, we're not, no, we're not. <laughs> we have to copy our MIDI information from our drum meet to our side chain. So that way, inside here, you can see the kick trigger is getting triggered and the snare trigger is getting triggered because these are exactly the same. And the other notes in there don't matter. They'll just be hitting blank pads on the drum rack. So you can just paste them up like that. Right? Side chain, too easy. You can see it working. So the reason I do it like this is because if you side chain to the drums themselves, you don't get the you don't get an accurate release time. The release time is kind of like based on how long the sample is itself, right? We can actually test that out if you want. We'll go to the drum meet, we'll choose our kick, and we'll choose our snare. Uh, yeah, I don't think it matters there. What's that? I mean, that's, that's side chain, it's working, but I've got no control. I can't make the release time any shorter than that. Well, I'll set it to one. There's like giant gaps in the sound. It's no good. So I set it to, back to the kick trigger. That's got to be pre effects. Snare trigger. This is still set to one. Right? This is how you side chain, boys. And then you, you can do cool stuff like internal side chaining, like this hat. I probably want to side chain that to the kicks and snares so it's not like layered with the kick and the snare boosting the volume higher than it needs to be. So I'll put that in. Like this. Kind of gives them a nice feel as well. All right, let's ditch these chords because they're bad. Didn't I add a crash? Oh yeah. I had a, I had a crash. All right, sweet, sweet. Let's get some more percussion in here. So because I'm heaps prepared, I have a bunch of percussion just like sitting here ready to go. And I can just drag this straight in, right? Let's get some Hitachi up in this. Don't worry about that. <laughs> we don't need that, all those plugins. <laughs> we don't need any of those plugins. It's fine. 
So yeah, that's a whole channel I just dragged in with all this stuff on it, which we're going to delete most of. Don't need that. We'll keep the. No, we don't need that. Don't need that. I made a lot of these a long time ago, and I haven't cleaned them up yet because I'm a lazy, lazy artist. So we're going to create a new group and call this. We'll call this the breaks. Add another channel. This will be the drum bus, right? Send the master out of there into the drum bus. Let's give this a color. I always color code. Drums are red, percussion is orange. And then the drum bus is red. That's just what I do. So now I can see that the combination of these two drum channels combined in the drum bus, I can see that it's peaking like crazy. <laughs> but we haven't sidechained it yet, so sidechain it. Yeah, that crash is really, it pushes it like 5 dB higher than it really needs to be. Guess what we're going to do? More sidechain. Okay, three and a half. That's not as bad as five, right? We could add a little fade onto the front of this. Mm, but you kind of lose a bit of feel. Let me, um, let me put a reverb on there. Listening from behind the speakers, so yeah, that's fine. Two, three dB over, that's fine. This is electronic dance music, man. We'll turn it down a bit, and then yeah, if you're not redlining, you're not headlining, mate. <laughs> it's fine. I mix I'm, when I'm writing music. I mix really, I mix loud. And then on the master, I just turn everything down. Because you can have a channel in Ableton hitting like plus 61, plus 62 decibels, and it doesn't distort. You can still just turn it back down again, and it'll be fine. So you can have, I don't want to like taint everyone's, whatever, whatever anyone's been trying to teach you here at this school. <laughs> but I, I just, the point is like, uh, you have to have a level, right? A level that, you, that your goal is. And you can always turn things down or up from there. So some people mix like, yeah, I have my drums at negative 18 or whatever. I just mix at zero. Everything's at zero. And then the combination of all my channels at zero is usually like plus 7 dB. So then I just turn it down by 7 dB. And then compress limit, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway. Might be the wrong way to do it. <laughs> I'm not sure. Let's get some more percussion in here. Yeah, so this one's a little bit, a little bit like this. So what I'm going to do, oh. Where am I at? By the way, just like, if you have any questions or whatever, just shout at me. I don't know what you guys want to see, so I'm kind of just writing this song from the start. Oh, I don't need that stuff. So what I just did there is I turned the um, warping um, envelope all the way down because this loop used to sound like this, right? But I'm tightening that all the way up. Mm. 
And then I'm gonna put this straight on there. <laughs> so you get that nice like open hat, which is like the coolest part of that loop, right? Um, but we don't want that open hat all the time. We'll, we'll match it up with this one. Whoops. That open hat, that open hat. So we'll just grab one of these hats, regular hats from over here, paste it in there. I don't like that double kick there. That's all you're really left with after side chaining. But it works, because you get that like live feel from the original breaks, right? And you don't have to sit there clicking like hats and trying to figure out like the velocities and all this of hats. I just sample like drum breaks. Sounds good to me. Cool, so that's drums done. What else can we do? Um, yeah, look at all the stuff in my user library. So all this stuff is just stuff I've saved over the years, right? Like in my bass lines, I've got a bunch of different categories of stuff. I got some growls. You gotta have some growls, right? <laughs> We've got a bunch of those. So I think one day I just like, I was watching an AU5 tutorial and he like, he was talking about um, this. Hyper growls? Huh? Is it the hyper growls video? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well you just like uh, render to, yeah, yeah. yeah, over and over. So I made a bunch like that. Um, and yeah, they're really cool. It's a really cool technique. I watched a tutorial and just made a bunch of growls. And now I've got growls, anytime I need growls. Um, but I think we want to use a Moog right now. Let me get, let me get like a, a Moog. And I just made this with an operator. By the way, everything in this pack right here, you can go to my website and buy it, it's 10 bucks. There's um, a bunch of cool thingies in here. Um, I call it the Essential Ableton Toolbox because I think if you're not using your user library in Ableton, you're seriously, seriously missing out on like some of the best features in Ableton. Like all that that we just did there. <laughs> I just dragged it in in one go. See that? I think it sounds better that way. Oh, we didn't even mess with the snare. Well, let's get a bass line in first, eh? Yeah, so this is a, a sub that I also made, which is a rack that I just would have dragged in while I was making this, which is just an operator um, with some stuff going on. I can't remember how I made it, but I spent a long time one day making it and then I saved it and now I'm just like yeah I need that Moog just drag it in whenever right also I love in Ableton 10 how you can just like click that button and that's <laughs> so good so anyway it's like Jam is fine, yeah.
probably make a, something simple. Something simple, right? Have you used that bass in a song this that you've released? It sounds familiar. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, that's probably. I can't remember. I just like have these tools. I just use, I probably adjusted it a bit, maybe. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Do a simple bass line, simple bass line. I think I screwed up some of those notes there. Simple bass line. Yeah, the way down needs to be better. <laughs> okay. That's the wrong note. Guys hear those clicks in there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Damn it. Oh, that's not the right search. Um, so I used the Live 8 compressor because something about the Live 8 compressor, it must be this um, FF. I was talking to people last night trying to work out what that stands for. I thought it stands for like the fast Fourier transform, but apparently it stands for something else forward floating or something. But anyway, the algorithm in the Live 8 compressor is different to the algorithms in the Live 10 compressors. And if we just make another rack exactly like this one, but call it the Live 8 compressor. Do you get the Live 8 compressor with Live 10, or do you have to like download that separately? Um, if you Google Slink sidechain and then go to the, like the YouTube video, there's a download link on my Dropbox. Yeah. Uh, I'm really sorry to interrupt, but if someone is parked out the front of the school, it's three o'clock. You're currently getting towed. Okay. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Let's set up. <laughs> If you can't find it, just go to slink.net slash contact and write something in there. Anything you send through that contact um, form on my website goes directly into my inbox. So it's just like sending me an email without telling you what my email address is. All right, let's focus in here. We're writing a song. Too many distractions. We're setting up, um, so this is going to be our live 8 compressor, and that's our kick threshold, that's our snare threshold. Usually I color these and stuff, but okay. Great. That's ready to go now. Let's see if we get any clicks this time. Oh, well, the release time is so low though. I'll set it to like 25. That's probably way too much. You probably want like 20, 15 to 20. Is there any clicks? Those climbing notes. The climbing notes? Like a lot more subtle than the other. Let's just like compare that to how it sounds with the live nine. 
I always call it a live nine because live ten is still new for me. We'll set it at the same release times, right? Oh, 25? Same release times. Wait. Oh. Not nice. <laughs> yeah. All right. 25 is a bit higher. We'll go 20. 20 release time. And the, I'm setting the threshold to negative infinity, so the volume is just like completely diving into the ground every kick and snare. But. I don't know. Probably want my bass down a little bit. Turn the drums down a bit. Yeah. I mean, I'm just going full out with that side chain compression. With a short enough release time, you can tell, you guys are probably better here, that it's being side chained, but I don't think it takes away from the feel of the of the bass line. And as you can see by the mix, the master, right? Is it 0.3, 1, 2, 2, it off? Yeah, it's like popped up to 3. Like that's, that's a lot better, but it, you don't lose any feel, right? Okay, let's do something cool with the bass line now. So this is the Moog, Moog bass. Um, just gotta add a new channel in, and we'll drag a sampler on here. And what I'm gonna do is, I don't have many samples on this laptop because this is mostly for, for DJing, right? But there's some really cool sounds in here. So what key are we writing this song in? D. Okay. Um, this is a great sample pack by uh, Black Octopus Sound. I love their bass one shots. You know, you ever get a, you guys have sample packs, right? What do you do with all these, right? They all sound cool, but what do you do with them? Well, here's what you do with them. You chuck them all in a sample like this, right? <laughs> and then, and then you can just go like right click, Distribute ranges equally. Uh. Okay. <laughs> and now what I'm going to do is pull the root key all the way down. So all the root keys, you saw all those R's going like that. And then these are in the key of D. So we'll put that on D1. Okay, so LFO tool. And we're just gonna map the ZN shift to this LFO, which is gonna be at maximum <laughs> and random. So now I can push the D key on my keyboard and it's a different sound every time. Or I can push the E key on my keyboard. Instant glitch out, right? <coughs> so, um, so how do we want to go about this? I think 
what I'm going to do is create a new channel. And we'll resample some of it. So I'm just going to fill this MIDI clip up with, oops. I'm going to fill this MIDI clip up with 60 D notes. Like this. <laughs> Hell yeah, that was sweet. <laughs> And then, well, I didn't even turn the groove on. Let's turn the groove on. So we could just like record a bit of that, right? <laughs> oh, it's a bit quiet, isn't it? Let's crank it up. Yeah, maybe negative three. Because we're going to side chain it. Don't forget. <laughs> we'll side chain it. It'll be fine. Okay. That was cool. And this will be our. Let's turn that off. To be our like chopped bass. Because we're not going to just play it like that. We'll, you know, we're going to edit it and put little pieces in between our move bass. But to do that, I just applied a groove onto this and then I recorded it with a groove on it. And so this MIDI clip has a groove on it as well. So although the notes look like they're there, they might be shifted. So what, I, what I'm going to do is just add another MIDI track and I'll call this like a guide. And I'll drag the groove that I have onto that. And we'll just color this like black. So it's kind of like we can ignore it, right? But we're also going to look at it intensively. <laughs> Okay, so now when we zoom in, you can see this is all the, all the sixteenths that are in the guide. So this will be um, a section rather than this. So I can like chop, if I don't like that sound, I can chop that out. Let's see what we've got here. I don't like that. That's kind of cool, but this maybe is a bit too long. That really needs to be a different sound. Let's just take like a piece of that right over here. Really short sound there, maybe. Did we sidechain this yet? We didn't. Let's sidechain that. What do you reckon? Should we use a live eight or the live 10? <laughs> we'll set like 20 milliseconds. <laughs> okay. That sounds kind of weird right now, but in context. Uh, we don't want to have too many of these mood bases playing at the same time as our super glitched up bass here. So I'm just going to take that out. Joel, we'll kind of end the phrase on that. <laughs> 
It's starting to sound like something. All right. And then we'll save the rest of this clip for over here. Maybe we could change it up a bit. But. So maybe I'll just like copy this MIDI information, paste it in here. Yeah. Oh my god, I have no idea what I'm doing right now. Oh, okay, I don't want to do that. I just want to... There we go. <laughs> More 16th notes. So what... We don't want to use the same samples. We'll delete all them. And we'll just grab, like... I guess... Any other sample, really. What's the highest note here? F sharp? All right, let's just take a bunch of F sharps. Can you see it all right? <laughs> okay, distribute ranges equally. Now these are all F sharps, I know they're all F sharps. So I can very confidently set the root notes of them all to F sharp one. Sweet. <laughs> this is like, man, if you guys want to write Glitch Hub, this is what Glitch Hub is all about. It's not about being calculated at all. It's, it's about just making Ableton kind of like work for you, you know? Like that's a cool result. I would never have made those combinations of sounds and put them together like that. Yeah, with Scratch on Serum, or every single one of those sounds. Like you've got these sample packs, so you gotta put them to use um, in creative ways like this, right? Anyway, let's keep going, see if, you know, a little finessing, a little editing to make it fit, but um, sometimes I do go in and um, add a bunch of serums and stuff, but. <laughs> that sounds pretty sweet. Oh, I'll, I'll get one more. Yeah, that one was sweet. Put this up here. Let's meet those channels. So we're using the guide here. I'm gonna cut like that sound out maybe. That might be a bit long, that one. If it's a little chip, that would be cool. Maybe a little longer. We don't need this sound. We don't need that sound. I'm looking to fill these gaps, but also like take some of these out, right? And just like maybe tighten things up a bit so it's not. I don't know. What's this sound here? That's pretty cool. Okay, what do we got now? <laughs> yeah, and you can just like keep going, keep going with that, and just make a bass line, just like that. 
Um, I guess you could also introduce another channel and if there's one sound that sticks out that like let's maybe process this a little bit more I'll use the my has polarity widener I suppose does that sound wider now Oh, you're sitting right in front of yeah. one speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's going to like this and shit. <laughs> um, put some reverb sizzle on there. But with heat more of decay. This reverb sizzle is, um, again, for sale at my website. Please buy my thing. Um, it's a reverb with a bit crusher at the end of it, um, which I think produces a really interesting result. Anyway. So now. You can kind of see where I'm going with that. Um, how are we doing on the levels here? That is actually not too bad. I've written songs that are way worse than that. Um, as far as like how I would like master a song or whatever, um, oh, I don't know if I should really talk about this because I haven't been to school myself about how to master and all that. You, you, put, you guys probably tell me how to master. But the way I do it, and this is not the right way, I'm sure of it, but it works for me and I master all my songs and they sound all right. <laughs> the, way, the way I do it um, is I focus really hard on the mix down. You know, I'll listen to the whole song and keep my eye right here on this number and any time it pops up way above um, my sort of baseline, which could be plus five or it could be negative five, whatever. Um, if there's a big spike in volume, basically, those are the things I zoom in on and try to um, fix because if, if you're putting huge spikes into a compressor or a limiter, you get, it's going to make it work harder and it's not going to sound as good. So I try to get all the giant spikes down to mini spikes and then you kind of just want like everything to be roughly a volume, a single volume kind of thing. So if the whole master is playing the whole song all the way through and nothing goes louder, than 5 dB, and most of the time it's 4 dB, except for in the breakdowns, then you're sweet. So you get on here, and you just turn the master down by the maximum volume plus one. So it would, you know, in that example, I would turn it down by like 6 dB. But in this example, uh, this is like turn it down by 2 dB, I guess maybe three just to be safe. Because you don't really want to run hot into a, um, into a third party plugin. You can run Redline between Ableton plugins and there's like, again, that 62 dB of headroom. So if you're just like smashing something through a saturator or something like that, it's totally fine. Um, but when you're going into a third party plugin, like all the cool stuff that I got for free <laughs> here. Um, you can't be sure on how it can handle hot signals, so maybe don't do that. Um, but yeah, you can just like, I would use like Isotope Ozone 8 and just like have like some multiband compression. I mean, this thing is pretty ridiculous, really. I only just got it like a couple weeks ago, so I'm still kind of learning how it works. But pretty much, I think what you do is you just click this button. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's all you do. Oh, you gotta play audio. <laughs> is that how it works, guys? I don't know. <laughs> and then just it masters the song for you, right? Sweet. 
sick. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I got a bunch of other stuff playing here. Oh yeah, this part here. Yeah. Should probably just mute that. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I I don't really spend a long time mastering stuff, but I spend heaps of time mixing it down. All the side chaining, side chaining this to that, and EQing that and this, and getting all these little peaks out as as best I can without using any limiting. Um, I spend ages on that stuff. Um, <coughs> But then when it comes to the master, it's so easy, it's basically already mastered. Just put like something on there to get the right like RMS or LOFS, <coughs> and, and then I stick it up on SoundCloud. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much it, yeah. I mean, let's go back to my, um, maybe we'll, I don't know how much time I've got left here, but maybe I'll go back to my old, the other project. <laughs> nah, I can write that song anytime. Nah. Um, I think I wrote this song in like a week and mastered it and then sent it away. Yeah, it's missing a bunch of stuff. It's fine, we don't need that. Um, yeah, okay, I got a fat filter on here. Come on, baby. Oh, it's fine if you're not looking at the plugin, but when you're looking at the plugin, it, uh, yeah, I mean, I produce on my PC. This is, um, but anyway, I think I was hitting somewhere around negative eight or negative nine RMS. I'm not sure. That's usually where I go for somewhere between eight, nine, and uh, seven, eight, and nine. 789, something like that. And yeah, you can see all the same stuff that I was just showing you in that other project, except just more of that. These are just little samples. Um, little chops here and there. I think that one might be broken. Yeah, my CPU is, uh... <laughs> Yikes. All right, well, we can do a couple questions if you want to ask me a question. Any, any tips for when you're playing, like, the huge audience? And you're nervous or something like that? Uh, how, do you, how do you cope with that, say, going from, like, trouble that you kind of threw yourself out there, but then you start getting used to uh, regularly playing bigger shows? Yeah, yeah, um, it's weird because I still get nervous before I go on stage, but, um, but I'm also confident because I know what I'm doing, I'm ready, I'm prepared. So like, really you can avoid being nervous as much as possible by being as prepared as possible. If you know exactly what you're gonna play and how you're gonna mix it and everything like that, then you'll be, you know, you'll still be nervous because it's not like, no one gets on stage and it's just like, yeah, this is where I live. Like everyone's a little bit nervous, but afterwards, once you start playing, then you'll fall into your comfort zone. And then at the end of your set, when people start high-fiving you and stuff, then it feels good, right? So you got like that to look forward to at the end. Can yep. you talk a bit about how you prepare a live set and how you choose your tracks and, and uh, what, you, what you use to perform live? Yeah, what I used to perform live. Um, I just use Serato, two turntables, and whatever mixer they have available, but I prefer like rain mixes. And then um, how I prepare for my set, I use Ableton. And I, I used to just like go on Beatport, download a bunch of songs, and then put a bunch of songs in a folder the night before a gig and then go out and play those songs in some order. But now, because I guess I'm a bit more of a headliner, and my, my sets, my set times have, have shrunken. Like I used to play six hours, I'd, I'd do my own warm up set and then hit them with the dance floor bangers and then everything. Like I would just 
freestyle the whole thing. But now, my longest sets are usually like an hour and a half. And so, and like all these people are paying to come and see me and I want to make sure that they enjoy themselves and that I deliver like the coolest, fattest music of all time um, in that set. So I prepare everything in Ableton. I'll put a song in Ableton and the next song that I want to play and trying to figure out the, the transition. And then sometimes I'll even like semi-produce a transition, add some drums or put a vocal line on top. Um, sometimes I go super crazy and take like two or three songs and just like mash them together because you know I want to be different I, I don't want to just play a song all the way through other people can do that but no one can do no one can play a song like me if I'm editing every song that I'm playing so I try to put my own like spin on each song inside of Ableton I come up with like my whole track list usually it's like 300 channels worth of stuff <laughs> my PC is a beast and then I'll render <laughs> I'll render each piece out like a Lego block and then set my cue points up in in uh, Serato and then I have like little scratch routines and stuff and then I mix it on the turntables so like all the hard work really is done before I get on stage and then when I get on stage I kind of just have fun playing the music and you know, watching people. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I kind of got a two piece or for you. But so you've given us some really killer advice about your work ethic and your journey, really. If you could go back like 11 or nine years and talk to Little Slink, what uh, advice would you give? Talk to Little Slink? Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> Probably. Uh, I don't know. Moved to Canada sooner, <laughs> probably. Because I, I remember like umming and ahhing about it until one of my friends was like, well, if they like you over there, you might as well go over there and make the money while you can, and then come home when the money dries up. And I'm like, still here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one more, what was your biggest um, on-stage technical difficulty? On-stage technical difficulty. Um, there has been many. I, pr I pretty much have made every single mistake there is to make. I've loaded the song on the wrong deck and hit eject on the CD player. Um, yeah, I, you can usually fix them pretty quick. Like, I've made all the mistakes so many times. Well, not so many times, but I've made them and they were traumatic enough to me for me to remember exactly what the solution is. And so when something isn't working, like the needle when you put it on the record, it's not registering Serato, I've got like an automatic like thing that I just, I just things just happen and I just like know how to fix it. Um, so yeah, the biggest tragedy on stage. Oh, you know what? When I was DJing at the Verve Cafe one time, this like drunk chick, was like dancing, she was dancing way too hard for like that tiny cafe. <laughs> and she like, she went like, she, she karate chopped my tone arm and it like bent it real bad. Oh. Yeah, and I was so mad. And actually another guy, I remember a bit later on after the Verve Cafe, um, some guy said on his way out at the end of the night that I look like Skrillex. And I was like, ha ha, I haven't heard that in the last 20 seconds. And then he grabbed an empty beer glass and smashed it on my laptop. Yeah. So I'd already finished DJing, but still, that was really mad. I was really mad. That's the only time anyone's ever like messed with my gear. Um, yeah, like my the bartender like spider manned over the bar and um, chase, she took her glasses off and just like <laughs> chasing down the street, but he was, he was bailing. But the club owner was really, really nice and we went Harvey's on the repair. So that was cool. How did you develop your brand and like your identity? Okay. All right, well, when I first released that record on Good Groove, 
um, Slim, the owner of Good Groove, was also a designer, a graphic designer, and he's like, do you got a, le you got a logo or anything? And I was like, no, I don't have a logo. And he said, okay, I'll make you one, um, anything you sort of want. And I just thought, give me that like 70s baseball kind of vibe with the big underline sort of thing or whatever. He sent something back. I said, it needs more sparkle. And he put like a bunch of lines and stars <coughs> around the logo. That's my logo. Um, just go down there. Yeah. Well, that's my logo kind of, but yeah. So it's still the same logo that I use today. It's been like evolved because that actually the other guy, um, Butters, who I met at that Rick's bar, he turned out to be a graphic designer as well, a really, really good one. And he's done heaps and heaps of posters and stuff. And he's drawn a lot of artwork for me. Like um, the seal guy, um, you can see the sticker there. He drew that guy. <laughs> um, this, this bird guy was drawn by Savannah, but basically, I, I guess how did I develop my brand? I, I kind of just met some designers and then they asked me what I wanted and I kind of just, you know, I want a budgie, a gangster budgie holding a golden chain. <laughs> like, that was my idea and then she drew it and yeah. Are those always like slink from the start? Do you have them like shop around different names or like anything? Is it kind of, is it the yeah. Of yeah. The way I've got my name is a really lame story. So I, I usually just tell people that it's because I fall downstairs when I get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a slinky. <laughs> but DJ Slinky was taken, and Slinky and every different spelling of Slinky was already taken. But nobody had taken Slink with a Y. So that's what I chose. Um, but like, the name doesn't matter, man. Limp Biscuit. <laughs> Limp biscuit. The name doesn't matter. It's what like the name represents, you know. Uh, what <laughs> is your most name. memorable performances? Most memorable. Uh, Any highlight gigs where you're like, oh, that was that was super. Yeah, rough. playing in playing in Israel was kind of crazy. I got harassed big time at the border because I was like the only guy in the entire airport wearing a hat. <laughs> so like the security like pointed me out and then I had got interrogated for like 45 minutes by this like giant Israeli chick. Um, and then it was really, it, it was interesting playing the show. It was just a small regular show. Uh, there was probably like two or 300 people there. And um, it was interesting because the songs that I was playing that I thought was gonna do really well um, didn't do as well on the dance floor and then like the weird experimental stuff that I was playing that usually is the cue for people to sort of like not dance as much but I still play them anyway because I wrote it and I want people to hear it. Um, the people in Israel were loving that stuff so it was interesting to me to find out you know these people want weird stuff instead of familiar stuff. It's a totally different culture. Um, I played Ibiza at Space. That was pretty sweet. I have a photo somewhere. I think there was like 8,000 people in the club. There's a few rooms. There's a few rooms. I think Disclosure was playing in the other room. I was kind of in like the front room where when you first come in, and get, grab a drink before heading into like one of the other main rooms. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the night, I played a bunch of drum and bass and people were going mental. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, a weird, it's a weird club. Ibiza is kind of weird because people would go there because they know that that's what you, where you go to party. Yeah. And so there's like all kinds of cultures and people there. You got like, 18-year-old UK boys, lads, 
going out for a couple of beers with the lads. And then there's like, <laughs> you know, there's like that kind of people. And then like, there's just like some older people that have just been like raving for like 30 years. Um, you know what I mean? There's like all different sorts of people there. So it was kind of tricky to, oh yeah, we've got some more questions. Um, as a producer, uh, I'm sure you probably watch a lot of YouTube and I know you have a YouTube channel. Is there any other YouTube channels that you would recommend that we check out for additional learning uh, that you enjoy watching? Yeah. Um, yeah, I missed Bill's channel. Yeah, yeah. You guys have seen his channel? Yeah. I was watching his channel before I started doing YouTube. And then I come up with a couple interesting techniques and I thought, maybe I'll make a video. And that was like six years ago. But yeah, Mr. Bill, um, I don't really watch a ton of YouTube in terms of like um, music production stuff. Occasionally I see a tutorial pop up on like Reddit and like the EDM production subreddit and I'll watch that, but I always forget to like, I don't know, I'm kind of a fussy YouTube watcher. Some people just don't get to the point, you know? Like seven minutes of just like, ha ha, listen to these birds outside. And then it's like three minutes of like, anyway, put a utility on the master or something and then you can push the mono switch to listen to it in mono. It's like, a, the, like yeah. But actually, um, a really, really cool video I just saw recently by this guy named Ryan, Ryan Tallchief, I Dylan, think his name Dylan, is. Dylan Tallchief. Dylan Tallchief, yeah, 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 yeah. Put out this video, and it was like a clickbaity title, like how to be a pro at Ableton or something. And I'm eating breakfast, I'm like, this'll be a laugh. Click it, it turned out that the first half of the video was like really, really well informed. And then the second half of the video was him collaborating with this guy named Inverted Silence to make a auto hotkeys script. It's like 2,000 lines of, you guys seen this video? Yeah. And then there's like all these sweet like menus and customize, like to, oh, I can't even talk about it, it's so epic. But it, was, it blew my mind. Basically just adds a bunch of shortcut keys for you to use in Ableton that like kind of address some of Ableton's shortcomings. And it was such an amazing video. I got in touch with those guys and invited them onto my Discord server. I was talking to Inverted Silence, so, uh, Inverted Silence, who wrote the whole auto hockey script and everything. And I'm like, so what's going on with you? Are you, you got a, like a computer science degree or what? And he's like, nah, I'm 18 years old. <laughs> 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 I'm like, what? <laughs> and he's like some 18-year-old kid from the Netherlands. So I was like, wow. Way to make me feel old. <laughs> uh, another question over here. When you got a manager, was it because you had the volume of gigs to demand it, or did that help you get more gigs? Um, yeah, you're not going to get a manager unless you already have a product because there's nothing to manage otherwise. Like, I was doing it myself for years, just emailing invoices and booking my own flights and hotels and stuff, and just like reaching out to people to try and get gigs. It was a lot of work, but I think what really um, helped was the, uh, just playing at Shambhala, really, and, and releasing a bunch of music releasing music, because then I'm not only a DJ that can just play like Top 40, I'm also a producer who can write songs. And that added value, like back in those days, listen to me, back in those days. It was, you know, there was, there were a few DJs out there that were just famous for being DJs, but there's not many DJs out there that are famous for being a DJ now, except for maybe like Q-Bird or someone. Even like JFB is producing tunes. So you got to do something to like stand out. And I guess I did enough to stand out. And I already had a product, an image, a f you know, some followers, a Facebook fan page. I had all my social media like ready to go. I made it easy. I always try to make it easy for my manager to sell me to talent buyers. So 
Yeah. And, and what is the job of the manager we don't know. He's he's mostly an agent, so he mostly just like contacts people, tries to get me gigs, he negotiates prices, he sends them invoices and contracts, he books my flights for me. Um, and then on the manager sort of side of things, uh, he he has a couple of people that work for him that try to help out by like getting in touch with blogs and um, just some media outlets. And whenever our whole crew is at a festival, we always do like some interviews or videos or whatever for various blog, this and that blog. Um, <coughs> and also <coughs> just recently, one of the people that worked for my manager has been um, posting on Facebook for me. Uh, because it makes sense for her to do it because my manager is going back and forth with like these festivals and these festivals are saying, yeah, we want to do like this two ticket giveaway, la la la. And, um, and then Thomas, like my manager, will just send me this huge email saying, okay, it's got to be going out at this time, make this post, it's got to say this, here's the picture, no, no, no. And I'm just like, why don't you just do it? You know, so it saves me a lot of time. I can just focus on my music, and then <laughs> the other day I looked at my Facebook page. And I'm like, oh, I guess I gave some tickets away. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I still post on my own Facebook if it's something worth posting about. But if it's like, you'll you'll you can tell if it's not a post by me because it's like giving away tickets or something like that. Anyway. I think that's all that they do. They also, we also have like kind of an in-house designer who does lots of work for us, like the posters, and she drew that bird and stuff. Um, and for a while, um, my manager was invoicing, paying, paying her on my behalf and then taking the money out of my money or something. He's an accountant, basically. He used to be an accountant. So he's got spreadsheets and stuff for days. Um, and yeah, it is, it's good value. But you don't need a manager. You don't need a manager. You know, all you got to do if you want to start DJing around Canada is just look at one of mine or one of Sticky Buds's or one of the Fun Kinds posters and just see what cities we're hitting and then just try and find the same guy. Hey, I'm a DJ. Yeah. I think Neon Steve still does his own like bookings and everything. Um, his girlfriend might help him with it. Yeah. So like in the beginning when you're like learning an instrument, you have the fundamentals and go over them until they're really good, and then you proceed with songwriting and whatnot. Do you find it's kind of a same rule applies to the type of songwriting that you do? Would you recommend for someone to start on some fundamentals, get really good at those, then progress to the next stage, or do you spread your, spread your time evenly over all the different concepts at one time? Yeah, I think I know what you're saying. Yeah, so like, I think you need a little bit of a balance. Like, you got to spend 90% of your time not writing a song and just like making all the different pieces to a song and building your user library, especially in the beginning, building your user library. But every now and then you've got to write a song to know what you're missing in the user library kind of thing. Is that sort of answering your question? Yeah. Yeah. So like, I mean, I do what I say, not what I do, because I don't, I don't spend too much time building my user library these days or adding to my user library. But yeah, just like, Try and, try and like assign days to things. Like today is drum day, I'm gonna make drums. Nothing but drums, I'll make, oh, I'm gonna make 90 snares today or something like that. And then tomorrow it will be um, serum sound design day or you know, today I'm gonna mess with um, making it, I'm gonna try and make a cool bass line without serum and by like resampling and putting in a sampler and doing stuff with samplers. You know, necessary need to maybe go and start remixing songs and 
maybe even DJing in Ableton would be beforehand, or we could just jump, jump right into the design of the particular parts of the song. Yeah, I mean, if you're completely if you're completely new to Ableton, brand new, brand new to Ableton, um, I think you just uh, it's been so long since I was new to it. I think you've got to set yourself a small achievable goal. Like in the beginning, I was just like, all I want to do is put an acapella on a funk song, right? That's all I wanted to do. That was my very small probably pretty achievable goal. And so I just set out to learn everything about what I needed to do to make that happen. Uh, and then I made a new goal. Maybe how do we put drums on that, and et cetera. And I just kept building and building from there. Um, yeah. There's probably some like beginner stuff you can watch on YouTube, though. I don't have any beginner tutorials, so don't go to my YouTube channel. What's that? Saddlewick does them? Okay. I don't know who does them. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, bro. What's up? Uh, given how long you've been in the industry for, could you talk a little bit about the changes you've seen over that time in the back end of it? Kind of like from when you went in up until the present day? In the back end? Just like what goes on when I close doors a little bit. Um, I don't know if I'm going to tell you that. No, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Well, I know for a fact that like if if someone gives me a business card and a CD, I'm just going to throw it in the garbage because that's stupid. It's 2019. No one gives people CDs anymore. It's like pff, send me a Snapchat of your Dropbox link or something these days. You know what I mean? Um, send me a link on Clip or SoundCloud. Don't buy me a CD. People give me CDs, I just throw them out. I don't even have a CD player. <laughs> There's no CD thing in there. What am I gonna do with a CD? So I guess that's changed. You can't give people, bit and business cards are stupid. Um, stickers are good. I, I have like some local DJs that give me their stickers and I've got them on my fridge. Like just like small time local DJs that sort of like have supported me on shows and whatever, they've given me stickers. And then next time I see them, I totally re remember them. It's like a nice way to kind of get someone to remember you, I suppose. Stickers. You're not a DJ in Canada unless you have a sticker. <laughs> it's true. Um, it's not like that in other countries. <laughs> I'm serious. Uh, what else has changed in the back end? Um, it's weird for me because I, I guess like I haven't stayed in the same place with stuff. I've kind of like, I guess, worked my way up the ladder a little bit. So I don't know. My crew, like my manager has m more people now. Um, I think there's... harder to get into it than when you started or in terms of the barrier to entry and all that change? Uh, the barrier to entry. I mean, it depends on what your goal is, you know? Like, I, I used to just be stoked that I could play music and get paid for it. I felt, it felt like I was cheating somehow at life. It was so cool. I didn't have a job. I was just going to bars, getting free drinks, and playing music. You know, I would have been stoked if it just ended there and I just was the guy that DJed at that bar for the next 20 years or whatever. Um, I had some goals, but I was also kind of like content with where I was at at the same time. So I guess just try to adopt an attitude like that. You know what I mean? You want to you want to get in, but you can't force it. You just got to, it's a slow grind, I reckon. Whenever you see someone that's like blown up or gone viral, you don't see like the years of grinding in the background that they've been doing. Like, yeah, the, and the life that they've lived leading up to that point. Some people definitely are like a little bit more fortunate and lucky 
like to be able to go to a school like this kind of like fast tracks your knowledge for sure um, but yeah so don't get like don't feel like shit when someone else is blowing up and you're not blowing up because you don't know what they've been through or how, how long it took them to get there any other questions Oh, yeah. Do you want to take one more question? Yeah, sure, one more question. What's your musical background? My musical background? I told you all that. Uh, I learned piano for like a year and that's it. I can't even really play that. <laughs> I just, I like taught, you know, I used fingers like this. Um, I don't really have any background with music. I, that's one thing actually I would go back and say to, was that you, Little Slink? I'd go back and tell Little Slink to learn some music theory, learn, really learn music theory, because that's probably my biggest weakness, is like my music theory is, it's patchy at best. Didn't you say that you use um, Odyssey a lot for that? Does that help? Oh, Odyssey, yeah, like, I mean, it's a cool plugin, but I don't use it that much, to be honest. Um, it, it's kind of cool to break out sometimes if you're like really stuck for any ideas, but I already have plenty of ideas and I can kind of fumble my way through like building a chord progression. It just takes me like too long. I wish I could like, I wish I was one of those jazz guys that was kind of like, oh yeah, that's F sharp major seven or whatever, but I'm not. <clears throat> All right, hey, let's probably wrap it up. Thank you so much for your time, for your extra time, for your big round of applause.